Welcome everyone to Science at the Theater's Health Detectives, sponsored by the Friends of Berkeley Lab. My name is Jeff Miller, Head of Public Affairs at the Lab, and your host for the evening. Do we have any? Okay, we're good? Okay. So tonight, we're honoring one of your requests. Those of you who received a audience survey form outside, we traditionally ask folks to fill these out, and one of the questions that we always ask is what topics you would like to see us explore on stage at future events. Human health and disease has always scored quite high, so tonight we are honoring your request, and we're delivering on the promise by assembling a group of scientists from our life sciences division, which if you don't know much about it, and some people don't, uh, really consists of several hundred scientists, all of whom are working on the secrets of disease, among many other things. So our panelists tonight include Susan Selnicker. Would you like to stand and just introduce yourself? <laughs> Say a little about you. uh, <clears throat> Hi, I'm Susan Selnicker. I'm head of the Department of Genome Dynamics and uh, the co-director of the Berkeley Drosophila Genome Project. You'll hear that word uh, a little more often in my talk. And um, uh, we have a very nice dynamic department, about um, 20 scientists. Great. Uh, next is Christy Canaria. Good evening. I'm Christy Canaria. I'm a research scientist in life sciences. I am also a microscopist, and I'll be talking to you guys later about uh, disease. Great. Uh, next, Gary Carpen, who's also the chair of the Life Sciences Division. Hello. Um, I'm Gary Carpen. I'm the uh, relatively new director of the Life Sciences Division, and uh, we work on uh, how traits get inherited from one generation to the next. Our last uh, panelist is legendary cancer researcher Mina Bissell. Uh, who has really changed uh, fundamentally our understanding of breast cancer and indeed of all cancer by showing how uh, what happens outside a cancer cell is just as important as what's happening inside. Uh, some scientists uh, tell great stories, others are great stories with Mina. We kind of have a combination of both, as I'm sure you will see later this evening. So please give her a warm welcome. I'm very happy to be here. My name is Mina Bissell. I'm a distinguished scientist, and it sounds like a real obnoxious title, but it's an honest-to-goodness title. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> I think I'm the first woman who had gotten this title at Lawrence Berkeley Lab. I was the previous, oh no, maybe two past, past director of uh, life sciences, and at that time we were very small, and then we grew, and all these wonderful things that you're going to hear. I do breast cancer research, and I have uh, one of these group membership in four faculty groups in UC Berkeley, and that's where I get my graduate students. Thank you very much. So, following the presentations, we will assemble here on stage in these chairs, and we will have a brief conversation, then we will open it up to the audience for questions. So please uh, give a warm welcome to Gary Carpen, who will start off this evening's presentations. Well, thank you, Jeff, and thank all of you for uh, coming and uh, listening to our little speeches. Um, so, uh, as, as you heard, um, the, our four speakers are from the Life Sciences Division, and, and many of you probably think about the Lawrence Berkeley Lab as being um, primarily focused on physics, cosmology, um, and, and certainly the lab has made a name for that in, in those fields, but there's been a very long history of biological research at the light in, at LBNL, uh, starting back in the 1930s, where John Lawrence, who was Ernest Lawrence's brother, uh, came here to study how radiation that his brother was producing uh, could be used. <laughs> Perhaps there was a better way to say that. Uh, <laughs> uh, could be used for health-related um, applications such as uh, treating cancer. So um, I'm going to give a, just a couple of minutes of introduction to the Life Sciences Division and then uh, launch into a, a, a brief description of, of um, why DNA is not your whole destiny. So um, to start with, um, so the Life Sciences Division at the lab, um, we have uh, a desire to advance basic knowledge about um, 
biology and biological mechanisms in general, and to improve the health of people and uh, the Earth at the same time. And we do this by elucidating the four-dimensional dynamics of biological systems, that is, looking at how biology works in time and space. We study uh, everything from very, very small molecules up to uh, human beings. So um, the kinds of advances that have been made in uh, the life sciences division over the years, uh, since, since Mina first started it, uh, have been revealing the impact of low-dose radiation on human health, uh, as you'll hear from Mina, redefining the causes of cancer. Um, we've also changed medical practice through um, uh, imaging of brains and also uh, development of, of uh, screens for cholesterol testing, um, explored genomes and epigenomes. You'll hear a little more about that from myself and from Sue, and also visualized aging and disease in real time. So um, this is titled The Health Detective, so I thought I'd spend a couple of slides just saying, uh, talking about the kinds of tools that we use. Um, and for one thing, uh, you know, even though we're ultimately interested in understanding how biology and changes in biology affect human health, we study biology in a variety of organisms, all the way from bacteria through these cute little roundworms, um, these even cuter fruit flies, <laughs> um, even cuter mice, and that one's not so cute? Okay. <laughs> and the not so cute um, <laughs> uh, human cells. And. Um, the other thing is that it's, it's great for a biologist to be at the lab because we get to leverage all these amazing technologies that come out of studies of physics and chemistry, et cetera. And so one is that we do a lot of advanced Im imaging of um, biology in real time. So this is, for example, a cell undergoing division, the red of the chromosomes that are being segregated and inherited to do daughter, to, to, yeah, to, to daughter cells. We also do live imaging of, of brains and other advanced imaging technology, and also look at uh, individual tissues, such as this mouse mammary gland. Um, we do uh, next generation, high throughput DNA sequencing. Uh, we use the advanced light source to study the molecular structures of various proteins and protein complexes. Um, and finally, we leverage the incredible computational power that's present uh, at the lab. Um, the kinds of questions we address are what causes breast and other cancers, um, do low doses of radiation impact human health, such as uh, radiation from mammograms or from airport scanners, uh, how does the environment alter genome functions, I'll talk a little more about that, what types of brain changes cause dementia, why and how do cells and organisms age, and how do organisms respond to climate change. So I think a lot of uh, questions that um, are relevant for uh, everyday life. Now, uh, in terms of uh, the work that goes on in my own lab, um, I've titled this part, Why DNA is Not Your Whole Destiny. And so I think most people uh, in this room probably have heard the word DNA and understand that um, it's DNA sequence, the sequence of the four bases, A, C, G, T, that determines our traits, such as eye color and, and height. And also, we're comfortable with thinking about how changes to DNA sequence, which we call mutations, um, uh, can occur, and that these can contribute to disease. So for example, a predisposition to develop breast cancer uh, within families is due to the inheritance of a mutation in a particular gene called BRCA2. Um, another way that we're used to thinking about DNA sequence is in terms of evolution, that is, that mutations to the DNA sequence can serve as, as fodder for natural selection to occur, that is, to um, select for advantageous mutations, and this is um, what we know as Darwinian evolution. However, if you go back even before Darwin, there was this guy, Lamarck, who um, in the early 1800s proposed that, in fact, uh, one could inherit acquired characteristics, that is, characteristics that are acquired during one's lifetime. And the classic example is this um, one with giraffes, and the idea was that early in evolution, giraffes were sort of like horses, they had very short necks. Over evolutionary time, they had to keep stretching their necks to get higher and higher food sources, and that ultimately you would end up with long-necked giraffes. Okay. Now, after Darwin, Lamarck sort of went into strong disfavor, and in fact, uh, the word Lamarckian is used among biologists uh, in a pejorative fashion. Um, but in fact, what we've learned more recently is that we know that traits and diseases can be altered by the environment, so by challenges such as temperature, uh, diet, stress, radiation, and most importantly, 
that um, changes uh, in function can be inherited independent of changes in DNA sequence. Okay, so without mutations, you can actually have change in biological functions and in the functions of the genome um, that are in fact um, um, uh, able to be inherited from one cell generation to the next or one from one organismal generation to the next. So this is what's known as the science of epigenetics. It uh, means above genetics, and the definition is heterable changes in gene or genome function without changes in DNA sequence. Now, you see this every day. Um, here's a hosta plant. It has splotches of green and white. These are known as variegated or mosaic plants. And in fact, these white and green cells in this plant have exactly the same DNA. So how is it that one is white and one is green? Well, there are certain genes that are activated or silenced early in development, that is, they can or cannot make proteins, um, and that once this decision is made early in development, that is inherited to the daughter cells, and so you get these clones or groups of uh, uh, cells derived from a common progenitor cell that are white or green. The other place you see this is in calico cats, where you have different colors. This is due to differential epigenetic silencing or activation of genes. All the DNA here and here is exactly the same. Similarly, all human females, in fact, all mammalian females, are mosaics. That means that um, half of your cells, one of your X chromosomes, that is for the half of you that are female. Um, you have two X chromosomes, one from your mother, one from your father. In fact, in your body, half the cells have one of those whole chromosomes inactivated. The other half of the cells um, have the other X chromosome inactivated. So in fact, females are mosaics. And finally, in my own home, I've had recent experience with this. Um, Two-year-old twins, they're genetically identical. We've tested it. <laughs> But don't worry, we haven't subjected them to any other experiments. <laughs> They're genetically identical, but there are significant differences in their height, their weight, and in their behaviors. This guy likes bowls, this guy likes the iPhone. <laughs> so significant changes uh, independent of DNA sequence. So how can this happen? Well, in fact, DNA, with its sequence of bases, is not just present naked in the nucleus. It's, pa it's packaged with hit proteins. These proteins are known as histones, and the DNA is, in fact, wrapped around them to form something called the nucleosome. Okay. And in fact, these histones can be chemically modified. There are enzymes that will add chemical residues, like methylation groups or acetyl groups. There are enzymes that will take them away. And there are other proteins that will read specific modifications and change the function of the genome, that's of the DNA that's associated with those histones. And there are hundreds of these uh, chemical marks or modifications, and they, the main point is that they alter how the DNA is utilized. So the DNA sequence stays the same, but the way that um, these proteins, these histone proteins, are modified changes, for example, changes the way it functions, either allowing gene activity or silencing gene activity, for example. Um, Interestingly, these types of marks are inherited through cell and organismal generations, and they can be reversed. So this is what's known as metastable. You can have gene activity, and then that can be reversed as well. And also, like mutations, uh, these types of changes to genome function mediated by modification of these proteins can also respond to natural selection during evolution. They can respond to environmental changes, and they can also impact human health. Okay. so. Um, what we've been doing, I'm just going to tell you two short uh, stories about work we're doing in the lab. One is uh, defining epigenomic landscapes. So like this uh, topographic map of the bay where you can see where the uh, water is and the uh, uh, landfill and the, uh, the mountains, um, we're mapping these histone modifications across the genome. And so the idea is to determine which epigenetic marks correlate with genome function. So for example here, you see these hills that shows that these marks are enriched in this region, these marks are not. These are marks associated with silencing of this gene here and any other gene that they may be associated with. And these marks are associated with gene activity, but they're not present in this region. Okay. We've done this mostly in flies. We're starting to do this in, in human cells as well. And the main questions we're trying to address right now, um, we're very excited to ask whether environmental challenges such as diet, aging, stress, 
um, radiation, change these landscapes, and in the process, does that correlate with changes in biological functions? And importantly, are these changes that occur in one individual able to be transmitted to the next generation, again, independent of DNA sequence? The second story has to do with a surprising role for epigenetics, and that is in regulating the faithful transmission of chromosomes from one generation to the next. Now it's gonna move, okay. So what you're seeing in this movie is the chromosomes are these sort of uh, black blobs. The red is what's called the spindle. It's a molecule called uh, tubulin. It makes ropes. And the green is this structure on the chromosomes called the centromere. And so what happens in cell division is that you get segregation of equal uh, amounts of genetic material to two daughter cells from this initial one. And the centromere and the spindle are very important for this. Well, it turns out that as in an old movie now, um, with respect to the centromere, there can be only one. And so if you have one centromere on a chromosome, so this is a chromosome after the DNA and the chromatin has been replicated, so there are two copies, and now they're gonna try to segregate to the two poles. If you have one, they can do that faithfully. If you have none, they can't attach to the spindle and they can't be moved to the poles and they'll be lost. If you have more than one, they'll try to go to two places at once and the DNA and the chromosome will break and that's not good. Uh, both, oh sorry, sorry. Both of those are um, uh, processes, uh, gains or loss of chromosomes are, are deeply involved in the generation of birth defects and cancer. Um, so, um, we've discovered that the site of centromere formation is determined by epigenetic mechanisms, that is, this one site being chosen is not determined by DNA sequence, but by these epigenetic mechanisms. And um, specifically, this site is chosen because it contains a specific histone variant. This is another kind of histone called SEMPA. And um, the important thing is that every time this chromosome replicates and divides, it has to um, put new SEMPA in and it has to put it back in in the same place, otherwise you'll get more than one centromere and, and havoc will occur. Um, and so we've identified proteins and mechanisms that are responsible for the epigenetic regulation of, of centromere identity and its propagation. Now, um, we've done this both in flies and in humans, and uh, one, one finding is that this SEMPE protein is, is associated in the cell with a partner protein uh, called a chaperone called HGERP, and HGERP protects this protein from degradation, and it also is involved in delivering SEMPE to new, uh, uh, specifically to centromeres. So it's part of this epigenetic propagation. Now, what's the relevance to cancers uh, or to human beings? Well, this is a, what's called a karyotype, where you can see all 23 chromosomes, in this case from a human male, and um, this is a normal karyotype called euploid. Each of these, uh, there's a, a, a method called FISH that's used uh, to uh, color each chromosome separately. So you can identify what's chromosome one and what's chromosome X. In uh, cancers, you see extensive aneuploidy, that is gain or loss of chromosomes. So notice that there are many, many of these types of chromosomes. There's not just two, and also a lot of color mixing. So that means there's been a lot of rearrangements in the DNA. Now, SEMPE and HDRP are both highly expressed overexpressed in many cancers, and the more that they're expressed, the poorer the prognosis for survival. And so what we've done in flies is to show that, in fact, SEMPE overexpression can result in, in, in multiple centromeres per chromosome and aneuploidy, and ultimately we'd like to understand more about this mechanism so that we can determine whether uh, inhibitors of, for example, HGERP and SEMPE could be used for, for cancer treatments. And so finally, I hope that this, this brief introduction to um, Epigenetics um, will help you. Uh, if you read the popular literature, epigenetics has in fact um, become a bit hot. Um, here it says, from time, the new science of epigenetics reveals how the choices you make can change your genes and those of your kids. Um, what I'll leave you with is the, the idea that epigenetic mechanisms are important because they, they alter how the DNA is utilized and they can contribute significantly to our destiny because like DNA sequence, um, they can be inherited from one generation to the next. And also that um, epigenetics provides a, an important interface between the function of the DNA and the function of the genome and all these different kinds of environmental uh, uh, 
uh, challenges such as climate change, toxins, diet and lifestyle, time and diversity, and nurturing. And these are questions that we're trying to address now. Thank you. So you've heard from Gary about <clears throat> his work with flies and humans. I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about why we work on flies. And um, the fly that we work on is called Drosophila melanogaster, and we use it as a model for human gene discovery. So why flies? The flies that we study are the ones that you see in the grocery store around the bananas. They're small, they're not pests, they don't carry disease, and they um, are very good models. Um, they have a very short life cycle, as I can, I've shown here. And this is the female. This is a male. Um, the female deposits about 200 eggs. And within a day, the egg develops into a larvae. The first instar it spends about another day in this state before it becomes a second instar. Then it spends about five days as a third instar eating lots of food. And um, it climbs out of the food, and it, it forms a cocoon or a pupae, just like butterflies. And it takes about five days for metamorphosis, and then the adults emerge. So within 12 days, you have an entire generation. So it, it's a great organism for uh, genetics. So it's been studied by Thomas Hunt Morgan, um, shown here. These are, these are milk bottles. And you can raise lots of flies in these milk bottles. And, and like I mentioned, they just fed them bananas or cornmeal. It's very simple to grow them in the laboratory. So the first mutants were found in, um, by uh, Thomas Hunt Morgan. A, a normal fly has a red eye. And the mutant that he found um, was a lack of pigmentation and caused the eye to go to white. And um, he was also able to show that this was sex-linked. Flies, just like humans, have an X and a Y chromosome. And this mutation was on the X. Two of his students continued his work. So this shows um, Calvin Bridges and Alfred Sturdivan in the 20s. And they studied more fly mutants and more um, eye mutants and morphology, um, wing mutants. And they were able to to make the first chromosomal maps. Um, they were the first ones to show that genes map to chromosomes. Here's another type of fly. This is called Lewis's four-wing fly. So if you were very astute and you noticed in that first um, slide showing the life cycle, flies, Drosophila, have two wings. And, and Ed Lewis made a fly that had four wings. And he did this by making mutations um, in a particular gene. And this um, gene was found to be conserved. And it's actually a set of genes that control the body plan in flies. And those same genes are um, used um, in humans. And you can see by this color coding that the gene that controls the body plan, the thorax of the fly, is the same one that, that controls development of the thorax in humans. So these genes are very ancient, very conserved. And it, it's another reason why flies are a very good model. Um, Ed won the Nobel Prize in 1996 for his work on uh, developmental genetics. There are four other Nobel Prizes that have been awarded to fly geneticists, um, one of them actually this year for um, work on innate immunity. Very important. Four years after Ed won the Nobel Prize, we published the genome sequence. Um, so here's, we got the cover of this journal called Science. And it shows the A's, G's, C's, and T's that Gary mentioned with the two flies. So actually, what does that mean? When you have a complete and accurate genome sequence, what exactly do you have? Well, you have about 80,000 pages that look like this. You don't really know much about the genome. So what are gene structures? You know, those, um, what do they actually look like? So DNA is the, the source of, you know, uh, chromosomes. And from the DNA is made RNA. From the RNA is made protein. So a gene structure, this is a simple gene structure. Oops. Um, the proteins would start here and end at the red. And, and this portion, these are called exons. 
the, the little line is an intron. So the surprising thing for us was that genes, the structure of the gene is not contiguous along the chromosome. And that the exons, the portions that give rise to the protein, are, are um, interspersed with these gaps. So that was a, a relatively novel finding. And in addition to the, the part that codes for proteins, there are other regions called these um, UTRs, 5' prime and 3' prime, that give rise to the, the non-coding portion of the genome. And it um, is important for understanding where these regions sit relative to the, the um, marks that Gary was talking about, the chromosomal marks that are also part of the genome. So what is the gene number? You can look for words in the, in the sequence based on the, the coding, and from that we found that yeast have about six, sorry about that, 6,000 genes, worms about 18,000 genes, flies about 15,000, and surprisingly humans only 22,000. It's only one and a half times a fly. How can that possibly be? It comes from the fact that a small number of components can generate a large number of structures. It has to do with complexity. So you can, with the same number of components, make something similar to this castle. It's relatively simple, has a couple hundred Legos in it, um, but with the same com building components, you can make something that looks like the capital. It's got thousands of components, and it's significantly more complex. So, if you look at the bottom here, these guys are flying. Complex structures make complex behaviors, and flies, surprisingly, have complex behaviors. Um, and you can see these two guys. They were bred to be aggressive, and they're fighting. Uh, and the, um, so that's one, only one type of behavior that flies exhibit. In addition, our friends across the bay, UCSF, have studied um, alcohol consumption as a consequence of sexual deprivation. <laughs> so they found that satisfied flies drink less alcohol than unsatisfied flies. <laughs> Something similar to uh, human behavior, I imagine. So we, we have the words of the genome, but what we really don't have is the syntax. What we want to understand, and what we did as part of this Modern Code project, and Gary and I were both participants in it, Modern Code stands for Encyclopedia of DNA Elements for Model Organisms. And so, as part of this project, we studied the um, RNAs that are made. So, this, the RNAs are called the transcriptome. We studied all, all of development, we looked at all of the RNAs that were made in, um, during development using the, what Gary alluded to, this next-gen sequencing. We studied cell lines. Um, Drosophila has cell lines just like humans have cell lines. They use humans for cell lines for the study of diseases. We can do similar types of experiments with Drosophila cell lines. We isolated tissues, um, the heads, the ovaries, testes, and looked at them. And in addition, we studied um, the proteins that bind to RNAs. So what did we find? Okay, so this is another gene model. It's a little more complex than the one that I showed you before. And it's for a gene called cadherin N. It's involved in communication, cell-cell communication in the brain. It's an extremely important molecule. It's conserved between flies and humans. And what you see underneath the, the gene model are these rows. And the rows are, every two hours during embryonic development, it's the RNA that is made. And you can see that there are certain exons that are used early in development, and then other ones it switches, and you use a different one at different times. So you can get complexity. From a single gene, you can make many, many types of RNAs, giving rise to many different types of proteins. So I want to finish with this complicated, um, elaborate slide. And these are, you're going to hear later in, the, in uh, the, this evening about two types of human diseases, cancers and neurodegeneration. And so I wanted to tell you about some of the models, fly models, for these two types of disease. So for, for cancers, um, people have studied a gene called multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2. So at, 
um, and it's an early death, and it's um, a disease that is associated with um, actually a loss of function of a gene, but you carry a predisposition. So you have a mutant usually when you're born, and then later in life you have a, another somatic mutation which gives rise to the disease. And if you look in, you can use the fly eye as a model, and you can, this is the wild type eye, and then you can express that mutant gene and get a, a change in the, the eye. And this is a light microscope. Copy um, sections, and these are scanning electron microscopy. So this is what that same eye looks like in the scanning EM. It's very uh, disorganized. And you can use this as a, a screen, and you can feed many, many flies different drugs, and um, you can actually rescue this phenotype. And they were able to rescue it in the fly, and they're using that same drug now in um, clinical trials to, to as a um, a drug to, to combat this, this cancer. So it's a very powerful model, and there are lots of drug testing that are, are going on um, using flies as models. For neurodegeneration, there are many neurodegenerative diseases, um, Alzheimer's, um, Parkinson's, uh, Huntington's disease is autosomal dominant, and spinal cerebral ataxia. So spinal cerebral ataxia in Huntington's are both the result of a mutation in the protein that causes an amplification of glutamine, which is a particular amino acid, and you'll hear more from Christy about that. And in the fly, this is the normal eye, and when you have that mutant protein with this expansion of the glutamine repeat, you see a mutant phenotype. And when you overexpress another protein, you can suppress that phenotype. So it allows you to identify the partners that interact together in the brain to um, uh, potentially act as a cure for that type of a disease. So this is a, um, the fly eye is made up of 800 omatidia, and this is a cross section through the eye, and you can see the omatidia have a very particular pattern. And this is um, for Huntington's, which is a more common uh, neurodegenerative human disease. And, you can, and so when you overexpress the Huntington's protein in the fly eye, it causes this uh, degeneration. And when you, again, overexpress this uh, mutant protein, you can get rescue of that phenotype. So this is work I should have mentioned that the cancer work is done by the Kagan Laboratory at Mount Sinai. and the, Neurodegenerative work is done by uh, Nancy Bedini's lab at University of Pennsylvania. But the, the take home lesson is that because of the rapid life cycle and the 100 years of genetic studies, these are really extremely powerful models for um, studying um, human disease. All right, hello. Well, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, as Sue mentioned, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about disease, specifically Huntington's and Alzheimer's diseases, two neurodegenerative diseases that we study at Berkeley Lab. Now, these diseases affect the brain. They cause death in neurons, and eventually in later years, um, neurological dysfunction, that is the onset of dementia, a cognitive decline, and in Huntington's disease specifically, a loss in control of motor skills and movement. So these diseases are actually ones we don't have cures for yet, but luckily at Berkeley Lab, we have access to some world-class resources to help us in our research. And so as health detectives, what we are trying to do is understand these diseases, the modes for how they occur in people and in, um, in the population, and to work closer towards a cure. So it used to be that if a doctor thought that a person might have a neurodegenerative disease, they couldn't tell until after death, until post-mortem, when they could dissect the brain and then look at it and say, that brain does not look like a normal brain. So here I have some images of brains from patients. On the left is a Huntington's disease brain um, compared to a normal one. And this region here, the striatum, which is responsible for controlling movement and motor function, is affected. In Alzheimer's disease, which is a common form of dementia, the hippocampus 
um, where long-term memory is stored, that area is affected. Now, if you take these tissues and look at them under a microscope after some staining, what you see is some of these interesting inclusions and sort of clumps in the cells, in and around the cells and throughout the tissue. Especially with um, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, many of these patients had these clumps when they looked at the cells. And we know now that these clumps are actually aggregates of proteins. And our current understanding for the pathway to decline for neurodegeneration sort of follows this, this schematic. First, there's a sort of trigger where a protein um, is either misfolded or overly expressed, and in the cell they tend to clump together, like I've drawn here. These proteins happen to be toxic for the cells. They lead to neuron death, and over time, um, the decline of neurological function. So how does, dis how does DNA uh, and changes in DNA, how does that lead to disease? As Sue mentioned earlier, um, we do know that Huntington's disease is actually caused by a mutation in a single gene, the Huntington gene. And in this slide, I've drawn here on the left um, sort of a schematic of the, of the gene. And on the right is the protein that it encodes for. Now, an interesting uh, feature of this gene is this triplet repeat. So we know DNA is CATG. There's this triplet repeat, CAG, CAG, CAG. And in a normal gene, you'll have a few of these repeats. And this gene will make a normal protein. Now, in the disease state, somehow this gene gets um, modified, mutated, and expanded in this region here where these repeats are. And the protein that's made is a little bit bigger, here in the blue, in the light blue. It's a little bit bigger, and somehow that makes it a little stickier. So this protein tends to clump together, and that somehow causes toxicity in the cell. Now, in the case of Alzheimer's disease, we also know that there is a clumping of proteins that happens. Now, in the cell, we start with this precursor protein. And there are enzymes in the cell that can cut the protein at a number of different places. But if it cuts where these arrowheads are, you make this um, amyloid protein that's released. And if the cell keeps releasing this amyloid protein, they tend to come together. They eventually make these clumps, bigger clumps, till eventually get these plaques that are observed. And these plaques cause sort of an inflammation response or a toxic response um, in the cell. And that leads to cell death. So what are the tools that we have as health detectives to study these diseases? Um, we, with technology, now have the ability to study not post-mortem brains, but actually live cells and, and patients um, using some imaging techniques. And so some of the tools we have are disease models, as Sue mentioned, the fly. Um, one um, thing that I really enjoy are fluorescent proteins. So scientists a while back discovered that jellyfish um, particular jellyfish, make this green fluorescent protein. We call it GFP. It's genetically encoded. Scientists studied this gene and were able to modify it so that it could be any number of colors in the rainbow spectrum. We also have interesting um, high-end tools to let us look at both live cells and patients' um, brains in live patients. So in this movie, I took some of that GFP I showed you earlier, and I used it to label another protein, a transport protein. And in this movie, you can see these green little balls are moving around um, in the cell. Uh, this transport protein is carrying a cargo, and that cargo happens to be cholesterol. And many of you may have heard of cholesterol in terms of um, you know, good cholesterol and bad cholesterol and something about heart health. But what you may not know is that cholesterol is also very important for your brain. Neurons need cholesterol to build healthy and strong um, membranes, as well as strong axons. So this is an interesting protein um, that has some implications for brain health. Now, in this slide, I took another version of that fluorescent protein in blue, and I used it to label two different types of the Huntington protein. On the left is the normal protein. You can see that it's kind of all over the cell. And then I took the mutant protein. And here in the cell, you can see it actually makes these clumps. Now, if I overlay on top of it that green colored transport protein, what you see is the green transport protein is everywhere in the cell with the normal Huntington. And with the mutant, it tends to glom up along with the mutant protein. So this kind of gives us a hint as to how this mutant protein causes problems in the cell. It somehow interacts 
and stops proteins from doing their normal business around the cell, leads to toxicity, and then a lot of that neurological um, dysfunction that we see in disease patients. Scientists at Berkeley Lab are also using live imaging techniques to study Alzheimer's in patients. Um, as I showed before, you can take chemicals such as this um, staining chemical here, apply it to tissues to sort of visualize where these amyloid plaques are in Alzheimer's brains. At Berkeley Lab, we've made an analog to this chemical. We've called it PIB for shorthand. Um, you can see the structure of it is very similar to this stain here. So this chemical actually does bind to amyloid in the brain. And it has this other feature here, a carbon-11 isotope. Now this isotope, I'll just tell you, is special because it has the ability to decay, interact, and then give off high-energy photons. And if you, have a, if you have a special detector like a PET scanner, you can detect these photons, use the information to regenerate a picture of a brain. And so that's what scientists have done using this PIB um, chemical. Here are some examples of brain scans from normal control subjects as well as Alzheimer's disease subjects. And in this color scale, in blue, in blue are sort of low intensity levels, and in red are higher intensity levels. And what we see um, is that in normal subjects, these brain scans have kind of low levels of staining, whereas Alzheimer's patients with a lot of this red have higher levels of staining. And so this sort of matches well with what we've seen in these postmortem brains before with the other chemical stains. And so um, earlier this year, scientists from Berkeley Lab published a really interesting, interesting story that maybe some of you have heard about. They did this study where they took three populations of people, um, young, healthy individuals, older, healthy individuals, and Alzheimer's disease patients. And then they took their brain scans with this special chemical and looked at the amount of staining in their brains. And with young controls, there was a sort of lower level of staining. And with Alzheimer's patients, there was a sort of higher level. Now with this older, healthy group, they gave them a questionnaire and they asked them, over your lifetime, how cognitively active were you? Did you do a lot of reading, a lot of writing? Did you play a lot of games like checkers, word puzzles, that sort of thing? And so they took these questionnaires and then sort of split up the group into sort of three levels. People that were sort of high, medium, and low in terms of the amount of mental exercise that they had over their lifetime. And then they looked at their brain scans. And what they found was, I think, pretty interesting. It looked like the people who had, had maintained the most activity and exercise and cognitive learning over their lifetimes had brain scans that looked like young controls. Whereas those who associated themselves with having sort of a lower level of mental activity over their lifetimes had brain scans that looked a lot more like um, the Alzheimer's patients. And those in the middle kind of fell in the middle. So this, I think, is really interesting as an example for how um, environmental effects, what we decide to do over our lifetimes, has um, a real bearing on our physical being. And so one of the last thoughts I want to leave you with is um, it's really nice you guys came out tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are keeping yourselves mentally active, which is great because then even like the inside of your brain, you're like, keep it looking young. So thank you and I'll give it to Mina. This gal is going to go places. <laughs> so let's see. I, um, it's, whenever the, I get asked to talk, um, I'm sort of like a mother with about 15 kids. And you, you try and say, what am I going to tell them in a short time? And it's very, very hard. So I usually just do the same thing. So those of you who were here five, six years ago and heard me, you can go to sleep. <laughs> for, about, <laughs> for about seven minutes, and then I'll have a few more slides to change it. So, I like to start by saying that everybody says, why do we get so many cancers? And I recently wrote an article, long one, saying the problem is not that we get so many cancers. The problem is to solve is why do we get so few? And let me see if I can explain this. And I think it has something to do with the second part of my title. 
So I usually like to start because remember I'm in Lawrence Berkeley lab and we have physicists, engineers. Nobody has any idea of what biology is all about. So when I try to talk to them or talk to high school kids, I start with this. This is um, lesson 101 in development of biology. So when your mom and dad met, <laughs> here, <laughs> here is the egg. And here is the sperm that found the egg. Now remember, there are thousands of sperm, and they never ask for direction. But one of them, <laughs> one of them sooner or later finds the egg, just by chance. And then what happens? It uh, becomes four cells, and then eight cells, and then 12 cells, etc. Then it does become an embryo, and before you know it, it does this. <laughs> yeah. So. Now, here is the amazing thing. The gene, as Gary very nicely showed you here, is basically the same as all the genes in this gorgeous lady's uh, with lipstick notwithstanding. But um, every one of these genes are the same. They have the same sequence of DNA. You are not the same as your parents, but you yourself are the same here, 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 prostate, so the guys would listen, and all the rest of it. So how is this possible? And did you know, well, I don't know how many of you would know this, but you have either 10 trillion or 70 trillion, according to two different sources. Now, who would have counted them? I have no idea. But imagine how many cells that is. That's even bigger than the debt of United States. So how do these genes, these cells that have the same genetic information within them make you you? And the bigger question of how do they stay you? How does the nose know to be a nose? Why does it turn into your elbow one morning? And of course, I used to say that to people about 30 years ago. I come from a background of chemistry and bacterial genetics, so I really didn't do very much biology. So I was one of these real idiots who had no idea asking a lot of questions. But at the same time, I wasn't corrupted by the textbooks. So I asked very simple but difficult questions. So I, this got me interested. And I said, how is this possible? And when I came to do my postdoc, which was God knows, long before many of you were born, I, um, it was the heyday of what they call oncogenes, cancer genes. Cancer genes were discovered, people were so excited, they had viruses that had a single oncogene, and they would say, this is sufficient to give you a tumor. Now, I thought about this, and I thought this didn't make that much sense. Because you have all these cells in your body, and again, as Gary said, there is radiation, stress, you breathe, you eat, you have too much fat, you do whatever, whatever. You have mutation, even if 0.0001% of your genes gets mutation. And of those 0.0001 become mutated and cancer white, you would be tumors, tumors, tumors all over you. And you're not. So why is that? How is that possible? So I did some crazy experiment that I don't have time to show you, but we put the virus in a chicken, we injected the chicken with a very famous virus that everybody thought it was a complete oncogene. It made a huge ugly tumor. We put the same oncogene inside an embryo of the chicken, and it just became a beautiful feather. The cells that we marked were inside the feather. Now, if we destroyed the feather and dissociated it and put it in a dish, it became mass transformed, mass malignancy overnight. So that was very exciting to me. But I tell you, I published them in a couple of really good journals like Science and Nature in 1980s, and nobody, it even didn't make a ripple. And I really don't mind because I honestly feel that having found that the oncogenes and suppressor genes and stuff was very exciting, and people just wanted simple answers. You know, everybody gives you money when you say, ah, oh, I did it, I found the important thing. They can have a company, they can have a lot of money, they can get, I couldn't get any grants worth, you know, I mean, it was something else. 
So I spent um, the last 30, 40 years of my life trying to answer these questions. How is tissue specificity maintained? Noseness, elbowness, breastness, prostateness, liverness. How are they maintained? How do they know not to change? How does one study this problem in mammals? You saw the beautiful model that Sue showed. These fruit flies, they make me so jealous because these guys can do amazing amount of mutation. And they can turn this into that. Now, it's very hard to have really good models for higher organism. How is the program lost in cancer and aging? It is precisely when a cell doesn't know that it's supposed to be a nose or a finger that it piles up, makes a tumor, and goes elsewhere. It loses its way. So if we understood why the cells knew to stay put, why the cells knew what to do, we would learn a lot about both cancer and aging. It is aging that is a huge risk factor for cancer. Why is that? And maybe we can talk about that during question answer period. And how can one use this information for therapy? And I won't have time to tell you, but we have lots of papers showing thinking this way could actually lead you to that. And now tell that to our representative in the Senate and the House, who if Gary stood up and said, I studied Drosophila, they would say, see, taxpayers' money is all going off to fruit flies. I mean, it's stupid. But it's this kind of the basic knowledge that is so important and so underlines all of the important discoveries of the many kind of medicine that you would be taking over your life or the thinking that helps you, you know, what Christy was trying to tell you about how to keep your brain <laughs> active, et cetera. So we chose the mammary gland, if you will, as an experimental organism because it changes during the adult life of the organism when the female mammals get hormones, then they go from virgin gland to the resting gland, then they become pregnant, then they have babies, and when they take the babies away, the gland comes all the way around. So we said it develops again and again, and it could make a one, it is just like a dorsal fila. So we actually want to find out how does the mammary gland know this. Here is a human mammary gland. This is one of the five or six lobes that women have. Here is where the nipple is, and here are the ducts. And at the tip of these ducts, as the animal get uh, pregnant, there is this structure that actually makes milk, puts the milk in the middle, in the lumen, and when the baby sucks the gland, it just all gathers together and then comes out. And has a wonderful structure, and these cells have a very pretty ultra structure. If you take an electron microscope, and you look at one of these cells. Here you see how beautiful polar it is. It has a magnificent organized nucleus. It has fat droplets. It has secretory activities that goes up this way. And it has a bottom and a top. And it makes gobs and gobs of milk. Now you say, well, the mouse is still too complicated. The mammary gland is still too complicated. Could we take these cells outside the animals put them in a dish, and find out how they know how to do all this and how they make milk. Well, you do this, and within literally two days, even with all the lactogenic hormone you give them, with growth factors you give them, everything else, this is what they do. This is the same magnification. The cells completely lose shape. They lose their polarity. Look at the way that nucleus looks. You look at this and look at that. They're completely different, and they completely forget to make milk. And you say, you stupid cells, two days ago, in the animal, you were making all this thing, what happened? So I asked the physicists and the high school kids, what do you think was going on? Well, when I was younger, I could think the way they do, because they are smart, I'm no longer. But you'd say, said, ah, something was in the animal that is missing in culture, right? because they forgot it. So what was this? And at that time, we all knew 
that most of our bodies are held together with these glues called extracellular matrix proteins. They are huge proteins like collagen. You know the collagen they put in women's creams and they say, oh, it makes your skin, don't buy it. It doesn't work. <laughs> so, but nevertheless, they, these are the molecules that they thought are like scaffolds, and they are. But I said maybe these molecules not only have information, maybe they actually tell the nucleus what to do, even though they are all the way back here in an organization called the basement membrane that is made of different kind of large molecules. And to make a very long story short, I made a model, and I said that these molecules probably signal the same way hormones and growth factors do, and the signal actually goes to the nucleus. The nucleus gets the signal, responds to it, and then sends a message back, and it goes back and forth, and I called it the model of dynamic reciprocity. Model of dynamic reciprocity. Everything about our lives is dynamic and reciprocal, including me lecturing and you sitting there and listening. Now, if you all the front row that I can see would fall asleep, I wouldn't want to talk to you. As long as you stay up and you're interested, I have the energy to get back to you, right? So we called it model of dynamic reciprocity, and we said, what do you do in the laboratory? You have to test it. So again, making a very long story short, we found this material. Now, what happened to you? Let's see. OK, here. We put a material that now you can buy. In the old days, we used to make it in my lab. We put the cells on the top. They pull this thing over them, they reorganize, and in no time at all, literally less than four days, they make this beautiful structure. This is what is inside the animal, that is milk, and this is what taken with electron microscope, but reconstructed, you see even the sizes are the same. And we said, do they only look nice, or do they, are they polar? Yes, they make a lot of milk, and they put the milk here, and they put other things here, and so we could make these gorgeous structure. They are absolutely full of milk. Here are these beautiful uh, nuclei around, and these are two of these things, and the red in here is milk. And as I told you, I am ancient, so I was getting to one of these big birthdays, and the kids made that. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we have, we have milk, and we have a lot. Don't look at that. Listen to me for a second, because I have to explain something before I show you my movie. So we said, this is wonderful. If the normal cells know how to do this, could malignant cells understand that they are malignant if we also put them in this three-dimensional gooey stuff that then can signal? Because we didn't have a method, uh, which we call assay in the laboratory, of how to distinguish normal and malignant cells from each other. Usually you have to inject them into a mouse, wait God knows months. Some would do it, some wouldn't do it. And we said maybe we can come up with a fast method that can distinguish normal and malignant cells, and we have done that. And here are single cells on the top that are normal, and here are, you see those little structures. Those are not single cells. These are structures like the one I showed you, and here are the malignant cells. If I, were, if I were to do it for you again, you saw that every one of them looked ugly and looked like tumors, so it's like having, and these are human cells. So it's like having hundreds and thousands of normal human asinus or breast up there and hundreds and thousands of malignant cells here, and we could use this for drug testing, we could use for doing assays, screens, et cetera, et cetera, and we have done a lot of these, and we have shown the importance of what I will now talk to you, which is the importance of a structure. So one of the things I have done in my lifetime is I have basically tried to take the idea about cancer from just growth irregular growth to something which says a structure of the tissue is very important. So there is wisdom in your nose, there is wisdom in your finger, there is wisdom in your liver. It's for nothing that these things look so different because they have different functions. And what actually rules those genes that are within these tissues 
all of which having the same genetic information is that the structure tells them to reorganize. It's the structure that allows them to do some of the thing Gary was talking about. Is this structure, you know, Gary talked about this cancer gene, so BRCA1 and BRCA2. Now, the women that, who have BRCA1 and BRCA2, they have it in all of their 10 trillion cells, but they only get breast cancer or ovarian cancer. Why? And even then, they get it only in one or two cells of the ovary or the breast. Why? Because there is a whole lot of other things that have to happen. A BRCA1 or BRCA2 are not death sentences. You can actually overcome it, as I will show you. So here we said, if you're right and a structure is the one that rules, we should be able to take a completely ugly, messed up tumor cell with those chromosomes that are all broken. And somehow, if we could make the cell to change its structure, even though the chromosome is a mess, they should think they are normal. Now, this was a really crazy idea. Alternatively, we said, you can take a perfectly good mouse and mess up the structure, and we work with these enzymes that mess up the extracellular matrix molecule called MMPs, and we made an engineered mouse where we could deliver MMPs in the middle of pregnancy, and these MMPs would come up and destroy the structure. And we said, if they do that, these mice should get tumor as they age. Now, that happened, and I don't have any time to show you that. But I'll show you a few of the slides of the one above. So here are the non-malignant with this beautiful structure. Here are malignant cells, which actually were derived from the same individual. So, we measured what was in the surface of these cells and what was in the surface of these cells, and we showed that many of the, what we call receptors, that receive the signals are the same here and here, but the balance was messed up. If this had one X of a given molecule on the surface, this one had six. If that one had five, one time of another receptor which controls growth, this one had six et cetera, et cetera. So it's the balance that is important. So we said, okay, can we take one of those molecules that is firing six times as fast in here and bring it to the level of that, what would happen? So we used an antibody that inhibited one of those receptors that was for extracellular matrix, and lo and behold, this is what happened. The cells got completely reorganized, they, you see, they are not 100% normal because, of course, they had all those mutations and all the mess, but the size is the same as that. They are organized. If we take this and inject it as it is into a mouse, no tumors. If we dissociate it and put the inhibitory stuff with it, they get a 70% reduction in tumors, and I you just have to believe my, uh, that I didn't select that one. Here on top, are these tumor cells, if we hadn't put that antibody in, and here on the bottom, every one of them look every bit as pretty as the other one, and I didn't put in the movies. Now, I am going a little fast here, because what we now can do is we did this crazy stuff. We used an inhibitor against an extracellular matrix material, and these cells had six times the level of the receptor that should make them grow like crazy, but they stopped growing. We didn't put anything against that other inhibitor, but they stopped growing. So we then looked at those other receptors, and we realized that when we, in fact, inhibited this one, when, in fact, inhibited this one, this is called beta-1 integrin, this receptor came down, that receptor came down, this receptor came down, and these are all considered to be pathways of oncogenesis or oncogene. So what did we do? We were able to revert the malignant phenotype with one, and in the case of metastatic cells, with only two of these inhibitors. It absolutely boggles my mind. So growth and malignant behavior are regulated at the level of tissue architecture. And if you don't believe us, please Google us.
so form and function are related dynamically and reciprocally. You mess up one, you mess up the other. So, I have had been fortunate in my life to have wonderful, wonderful, brilliant students and postdocs. This gal did something very pretty. She was a bioengineer. She's now at Princeton, and I just heard last week she got tenure in five years at Princeton, which I think is amazing. And this was a technician in my lab who now became a graduate student. They had a beautiful um, uh, paper in science because the way we modeled the normal asinus and learn so much about tumor, we said we wanted to learn about metastases, and again, we will be modeling the mammary gland which branches and moves into the fat pad. It invades the fat pad. But what happens, which is amazing, is that when You gotta stop that the tumor cells hijack. And when you have a tumor cells at the tip of this thing, they actually do this. And we published a beautiful paper in Science in 2006. I wish I had time to tell you, I can't. But it's a very exciting stuff. And then this uh, wonderful physicist came to my lab recently, so I now have bioengineers, engineers, physicists, etc. And she said, how soon do you have to add this stuff in order to revert the malignant phenotype? I said, well, after 36 hours, we can't do it. But when we add, they kill the tumor cells, but they won't revert it. She said, why? I said, I don't know. She said, I imaged. So like Christy, she went and imaged. And boy, did we discover something that we had no idea existed. We put human breast cells from adult breast or from these cell lines of the breast in this gooey, gelatinous material, and look what happens. They move as if they're an embryo. They just do this magnificent thing, and we never understood how come they're all the same size. Were there all these physical laws that apply and make that thing a beautiful asinus? Now, if we were to compare the normal, oh, okay, good, they are playing. So you see the non-malignant is going very nicely and then becomes four. The malignant, you see the cells separate and they go here and they go there. So we realize that the reason these cells make these structures, which then makes the structure of the breast, is that something we didn't know before. When one cell becomes two, they are still stuck together with those adhesion molecules that I think it was Sue who talked about e adherin. these adhesion molecules that attach the cells to each other. And then when cells divide again, only one of them divides. So two become three, and three becomes four, just like the stem cells. These are adult cells or even cell lines, and they still remember. So we were so excited. We have a wonderful paper in Proceeding National Academy of Sciences, and LBNL wrote big news about it and stuff. And again, I wish I had more time, but I don't. And I just want to finish by telling you that why am I showing you this funny stuff? <laughs> Here is water coming into the shore from taken from a NASA satellite. Here is coral. And those of you, if I had time to show you, the way the mammary gland branches, if you open it up and make a whole mount of the mammary gland, it would look like that. Now, does that look, do they all look as if they have something in common? Why is it that nature, over and over and over again, makes these amazing shapes, both physical, biological, and all sorts of other things. So I'd like to um, submit to you that, as Sue showed, we know everything about every nucleotide of the human genome. We know everything about the language of the genome. We know everything about the alphabet of the genome. But we know nothing but nothing about the language and alphabet of form. 
And I say to the young people in the audience usually when I give these talks, I say this is a whole new horizon. Go to it. There is so much we don't know. There is no reason for scientists to be arrogant. And boy, are there so many of them who are arrogant. The more famous they get, the more arrogant they become. They get so full of themselves that it's absolutely impossible. So if you try to say, hey, part of what you're saying is right, but the other part isn't, they say off with her head. And they did a lot of that to me. So this is my very favorite cartoon. <laughs> so <laughs> the, guy, the guy is telling the cat. I love the way that cat looks, right? So, so he says, never, ever think outside the box. So I always say, always think outside the box. Always think outside the box. Otherwise, you will not make discoveries. You're going to put, and all these fancy journals don't want to publish this stuff because they're a jump. And I say to people, it's OK, publish it. Sooner or later, after 30 years, they now give me so much more money than I have a big group. There is a lot of money. We are doing a lot of wonderful things like what I just showed you about those, those movies. But I say to the student again, don't listen to me. Why shouldn't you listen to me? Because I used to be the cat, and he was the authority. Now I have become an authority. And when you have become an authority, you sometimes miss. You get full of yourself. So don't listen to me. Go trust yourself. So, let's see if I can do this. The number of my group, and the reason I like to show this is because I'm my physicist po postdoc. This girl is one of the smartest postdocs I have had, maybe the second smartest, or maybe even, th she's from Trinidad. And I say to her, this, this field that we have put on the map is called the field of microenvironment. Tumor microenvironment, normal microenvironment. The reason you don't get more tumors is because your microenvironment, which is right around your cells, is telling you you're still a tissue. So you can have mutation, mutation, mutation until you're blue in the face. You don't get tumors until the structure goes. But if you return the structure even with one hit, as I showed you, despite the malignant genome, the cells think they are normal. And that explains why cancer takes 30 years, why it doesn't happen overnight, at least most of the cancers that we know. Anyway, she's from Trinidad. Her mom was a mathematician. Her dad was an engineer. She was born. And they said, you're going to be a physicist? You're going to be a physicist? She's a physicist. And boy, is she good. And unfortunately, we tried to keep her. But she's going to NIH, but good for NIH. All right. And I went for a few months in France. I came back, and eight of the couples in my lab had babies. So they, <laughs> so, so may, they made a human asinus, and here is the milk. <laughs> All right, I, I debated in college between English and chemistry. And chemistry won, but I have always loved poetry. So I, the reason I show you this is because I love this poem from Yeats. It's called Among School Children. It says, O oh, chestnut tree, great rooted blossomer, are you the leaf, the blossom, or the bowl? O oh, body sway to music, O oh, brightening glance, how can we tell the dancer from the dance? Now, I used to dance in the old days. Here is Merce Cunningham. When he dances, you have a dance and a dancer. The minute he stops, you neither have a dancer nor do you have a dance. So it is with form and function. So it is with your brain and your body. That's why exercise is so good for you. That's why brain exercise is good for your body and physical exercise is good for you. So remember that wholeness is important, but understanding the pieces of the wholeness is also very important. But at the very end, we have to understand the organism in its entirety. And that's not an easy task. And we are so far away from it. This is Lawrence Berkeley Lab. For those of you who have not up here, have not been up there, uh, it's above Berkeley campus. It has this very beautiful dome. It has that gorgeous view. We are not, folks, Lawrence Livermore, OK? 
Not I have anything against them, but we don't do defense-related stuff, and I have nothing against defense. But we do a lot of good biology, we do a lot of the rest, and when they smash the first atom bomb, it was the cyclotron that Lawrence put together. They kept the dome, they put it on the top of a synchrotron radiation source, which people like Christie use, and people who are doing the structural biology come and use it, and, and it is really a wonderful thing. But I have an ulterior motive. Being the last speaker here, this being night, what does this look like? A breast? <laughs> <laughs> Now, don't ever mix us up. People say to me, Mina, we had seen this thing forever. We come here to do experiment. We ne one now will never think of another one. I said, good. <laughs> now you will remember. And thank you very much. I'm done. Okay, uh, we're running a, a tad bit late, so I'm only going to ask one question before we open it up to the audience, because I know there are probably a lot out there. But I think one of the burning questions we always have is how quickly do things move from the lab into therapy? So um, there are lots of discoveries that scientists make. Many of them don't end up uh, turning into either diagnostic procedures or beneficial medicines. So what's, what's the rub there, and how long does the, do these things typically take? Anyone who would that question, any, well. Anyone who would care to answer? <laughs> Would, you, would any of you like to say something? No? Go ahead, <laughs> Nina. <laughs> okay, well, um, you know, I mean, I thought both Christy and everybody else talked about the fact that these models we have developed, I think they're very, very useful. And I think they're useful because we know their function. And the problem, of course, is that drug companies need to make money, and so therefore they are not necessarily after the most important discoveries if they are not already patented. So one of the things that we have been fighting about is that FDA should relax some of the rules in terms of being able to test a lot of known molecules. For example, one kind of the, um, of the, uh, of the uh, cancer drug by itself may be effective, but it does a whole lot of horrible things to people. We have shown that if we use this inhibitory antibody in mouse, after we put a tumor, and then we irradiate the mouse to kill the tumor, we can reduce the level of radiation by 75%. Can you imagine that we can go from eight grade to two grade, what it means for women? If we do two things together, then we can actually get the same amount of killing as, as the radiation alone or as the other one alone. So we need to go to more personalized medicine, and we need to go to more sophisticated test, not just the kind of test that sequences, but the kind of test that takes account of all the things that this group talked to you about. Anyone else like to comment? No? It yes. takes a long time. <laughs> <laughs> it is true. It's the short answer. <laughs> OK. Yep. All right. So uh, let's begin with some audience questions. We have some. We can start. Uh, over there, over there, over there. Over here. Over there? Two. Here. Yes. John's area. Oh, okay, fine, thank you. Dr. Bissell, I'm just amazed. That was fascinating. The last part, you showed the landscape and everything, mm -hmm. and I, it reminded me very much of fractals, and I think I've really? seen, and well, I wondered if you could comment on that. Well, a lot of people ask me that question, but to tell you the truth, I have forgotten both my chemistry and physics. So, <laughs> I, I mean, at my age, you, you know, I should be forgotten, but but the science of fractile is very much like what I was talking about in terms of the fact that many things end up making the kind of structure they must. It's sort of like a snowflakes, where every one of them have the same edges, but they have different forms. And uh, we now have a program called Physics and Cancer. And uh, we got one of those uh, centers in US. There are about 12 of them. And between Berkeley, UCSF, and um, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, UC Berkeley and Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And we are actually trying to study this kind of ideas in terms of how to bring physics and chemistry and engineer into breast cancer, uh, not into cancer research, in order to answer the question. And one of the things that we set out to do was to ask the question, how does the cell know how to make this beautiful astronaut? 
And as you saw at the end, when I showed this, it was a physicist who helped me to do that, but she had to come to my lab. I would have had to develop that thing in order to put us together, so it's paying dividend, and we are getting it little by little. Okay, over here. I have a question about chromosomes. Um, you, ha you showed that in cancer cells, the chromosomes get very fragmented and broken apart. And um, one of the things that came out of the whole Dover trial is the evidence that you know, humans have, I think, what, 23 pairs, and chimpanzees and other apes have 24 pairs of chromosomes, and there was a, like a, a fusion event. So what's the difference between that fusion event that doesn't cause problems and then you know, the, the chromosomes that you were showing? So that, that's a good question. In fact, um, <clears throat> so evolution is in fact marked by many, many chromosome rearrangements. And um, so I think that the, the thing to keep in mind is, is selection, that, that the earth <laughs> selects for things that work, right? So um, you can have rearrangements uh, during evolution, many of which will end up killing the organism, giving rise to, you know, no uh, speciation, no new species. Um, uh, but in fact, uh, you can also have chromosome rearrangements that cause problems like cancer as well. So, you know, there's, there's no way to really, uh, it's not as if it's a directed process, that one type of rearrangement is, is in terms of evolution is directed, and uh, another in terms of cancer is random. Uh, it's really just a matter of what works and what doesn't work. Now, you know, in fact, the, the uh, work that I talked about with respect to centromeres is, is directly relevant to this because um, it's hard to imagine that something that's so essential as how chromosomes get segregated uh, during division would be encoded by something as wishy-washy as an epigenetic mechanism. This is something that should be, you want one side on a chromosome, you should, you should choose that site based on DNA sequence and always keep it that way. But in fact, it's probably um, arisen because of evolution and because of evolutionary pressures. Um, and so the idea is that, that if um, <clears throat> you say that chromosome rearrangements happen frequently in, in uh, evolution, well, the problem with the chromosome rearrangement is that one of the, the, the end results of that will be loss of a centromere and another will be a gain of an extra centromere and that, as I showed, would be, would be detrimental to the cells. So the fact that it's plastic, that you can get, take something that has no uh, pre-existing centromere and add one on can rescue that chromosome that got fragmented um, and allow the species to continue. Uh, another uh, another um, answer for that is that um, the rearrangements that survive are between genes. They don't disrupt the genes. Rearrangements that occur within a gene can lead to new gene function or they could be very detrimental and lead to death. So you wouldn't even um, see them. And in fact, uh, we now know that in cancer, um, there are alternative splicing of these different genes. So these different exon and introns that Sue talked about come together. And in a cancer cell, there are many functional genes that have alternative splice. And those alternative splice do something a lot more nasty than what they should do. So it, uh, it's, it's sort of nature uses it in many different ways. So Gary, you mentioned uh, evolution earlier. So uh, is there any beneficial role that radiation plays? You want me to answer that because of that paper? You can. <laughs> Let Gary answer it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I think to, to step back a bit, <laughs> uh, we and all other organisms on Earth have grown up and evolved with, with thank you, with, um, I usually have a very loud voice, so I tend to avoid microphones, but this is a case where it doesn't work. Um, and so, you know, we've grown up in an environment that has radiation, so it's not like radiation is necessarily bad in all cases. We might, in fact, use it in <laughs> positive ways uh, that we're unaware of, but um, I think what, what Jeffrey and uh, Mina are referring to is a recent paper from, um, uh, spearheaded by our uh, junior colleague, uh, Sylvain Cost, uh, that Mina was involved in as well, and it's part of this low-dose radiation program that we um, are part of that's uh, supported by the Department of Energy. And um, what Sylvain found was that, uh, so um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, U.S. regulations, the, the regulations say that any dose of cancer, uh, <laughs> sorry, any dose of radiation is in fact detrimental. Um, but it's questionable uh, as to whether low doses of radiation are sort of the equivalent or 
uh, similar to high doses of radiation and whether they, the response is linear, so that as you go up higher in doses of radiation, you'll have more cancer, for example. So the question is, as you go down and down, is it really a line or does it fall off at some point? And so this recent paper from Sylvan suggested that at least at the level of how DNA that's damaged by radiation is repaired, it seems that low doses, in fact, are not as damaging as high doses of radiation, or at least in, in, in a, per, a per dose way. So, you know, uh, this made it into the popular press because uh, some people want to read this and say that, well, airport scanners aren't a problem. <laughs> and uh, that's not what the study said, um, but it does open up the question as to whether our regulations are in fact consistent with what happens in biology. The reason, the reason is that there were many papers that they said low doses of radiation, in fact, does not get repaired. And so therefore, low doses are even worse because if you have little low dose, low dose, low dose, low dose, they don't get repaired and it all adds up. And that because nobody can measure what happens at very, very low dose, people always just drew a straight line. And uh, there are some evidence from other laboratories, and this particular one from Sylvain's laboratory showed that, in fact, now that he can image the radiation response, he can see that, in fact, at low dose, things do get repaired, and they get repaired about 50-fold better than high doses. This was something really interesting that people didn't know. And whether or not that means that low dose, low do how low do you have to go where danger is not there or whatever, we have no idea. It's going to take a long time to do that. All we showed, all Sylvan showed, and I helped a tiny bit, is that, is that there is repair and there is robust repairs at low dose unlike what people have published. So that's very good. And now we are trying to do it in the three-dimensional model because the first uh, paper were done all on plastic and the ones that Sylvan has done this proves them on plastic, but now we are really interested to see whether or not low dose in three dimension uh, is able to repair. And after that, of course, we want to do animal studies. And some people in the lab, and Gary is actually the head of this group, um, are doing that kind of stuff, collaborating together, taking it to animals, and then. Great, thanks. Uh, next question, please. Uh, so Gary was talking about uh, epigenetics, and it, it seems clear in an organism why epigenetics is important, because as, as a lot of people were saying, all the cells have the same genome, and they act differently, and so it's, it's got to be epigenetics. But you were also s talking about intergenerational epigenetics, and that seems kind of surprising, and mm -hmm. contrary to the sort of central dogma of, of biology, you've got just these germ cells that are these tiny little things and somehow you're still saying that epigenetic effects are gonna manifest in the next generation. I yep. mean, how important is that? How often does it happen? Are you, are you studying Yeah, so that th like that's, that? that's an excellent point. And um, so I'd say this field is in its infancy, um, or at least a fetus, uh, <laughs> if not <laughs> a conceptus. But um, there are, again, back to model systems, there are very good examples of transgenerational inheritance of epigenetic changes. Uh, one recently published last year um, uh, showed that if you heat shock, raise the temperature, again, this is in flies, you raise the temperature in one generation, that it can affect gene silencing for five generations. Now, there are a lot of such studies coming out in the literature about humans um, where they look for changes in epigenetic marks that are transferred from mother to progeny. And that clearly is seen, but it's much more complicated with humans because they're not well-controlled experiments. Unfortunately, we all mate with whoever the hell we want. And, you know, we don't really pay attention to our diet uh, much of the time. No, but so humans, you know, it's much harder, but there's clear evidence that it's happening. Um, one issue is, though, that, that you have to take it past two generations, because if you say, there, there's, for example, there's been a recent study from uh, UCSF about uh, women subjected to stress during pregnancy. And, and the assay used um, is a bit of a strange one, but it was whether the pregnant mother was close to or far away from the World Trade Center on September 11th, 2001. And so they did a whole bunch of things to figure out wh which mothers were stressed, which ones weren't. And it turns out that the progeny 
of the women who were stressed had shorter telomeres, the ends of the chromosomes. And when they're shortened, then you get these kinds of chromosome fusions and rearrangements and things like that. Now the problem is that those progeny, those fetuses, were in the mother at the time that this was happening. So what you really have to do to look at transgenerational is ask whether their progeny will now have uh, shorter telomeres and things like that. So I would say that the jury is still out in terms of the number of examples that we can point to in humans where we can pr um, prove transgenerational inheritance. Right, but, but what about the basic mechanism? I mean, what is, if it's not the genes, what is it that's communicating? Come back ah. and talk to him. Well, it's just very <laughs> briefly, yeah, we it's, remember I talked about chemical modifications to the proteins that the genes are wrapped around. And so that's what gets inherited. It turns out that that too can go along with the DNA through cell division, through the germline, to the progeny, continue on through the germline. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, next question, please. Uh, yeah, my question has to do with how Alzheimer's spreads from neuron to neuron. And I just read some recent research that it had something to do with uh, misfolded proteins and there was some debate about how it spread, and there was some research that said, well, this is the way it happens. But I didn't quite understand it. Maybe you can explain it. So any, any, any of you can also chime in at any time. But um, what I'll say is what we know about Alzheimer's is, is not a complete picture. So what I showed you was this sort of buildup of amyloid proteins that happen in a cell. And making of the release of this amyloid protein is contingent upon enzymes cutting this precursor protein at specific spots. And so there are genetic mutations that can happen that make the protein more susceptible to getting cut at those spots. And those people will have a tendency to develop Alzheimer's. But not everyone who has or develops Alzheimer's disease has those particular mutations. So does it spread? Uh, like, I mean, does the fact that one cell has Alzheimer's or has that mutation, is it somehow communicated to uh, another cell, another neuron? And I, I think this might be referring to the, the prion hypothesis. Yeah, yeah, um, it's something, a misfolded protein, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so this is the, the uh, this is far beyond my <laughs> expertise, but um, uh, oh, I'm forgetting his name over at... Um, you see Dan Prusner. Prusner, thank you, won the Nobel Prize for discovering yeah, yeah. prions, which were these very strange uh, uh, misfolding of proteins that can be, like epigenetics in a way, <laughs> propagated. Um, so what happens in that case is, and I think it's involving not just the amyloid, but a protein called tau. And so once you get that initial misfolding event, then that can be propagated to other amyloids in, in, that are secreted outside of the neurons or, or yeah, and so many of these aggregates um, are formed not, all, not only inside cells, but they get pushed outside cells. And so other cells can start to see these And they can pick aggregates. it up. Yeah, and, and they build up. Thank you. Did you ask your question? Uh, we. <laughs> OK, uh, all right. OK. So let's take another one from here. I think we're, we have a backup on this side. Hi, so, uh, so I am interested in inflammation as it applies to all of this. It's a little hobby of mine. And I'm interested in um, uh, C plus reactive proteins. And I'm sure it applies in, you know, it's in part of our bloodstream. And uh, for me, as a, a living test tube for my own life, uh, I wonder how I can, what you could say about a C plus reactive protein. And, and uh, then maybe I would get something about how to live my life, uh, you know, to deal with that. Because I'm sure we all Remember, I'm not a medical doctor. <laughs> <laughs> or as my parents would say, your brother's a real doctor. <laughs> um, well, you know the C-reactive protein, or should I answer? You, you should. It's, uh, it's the protein that people use to see whether or not somebody may be having ovarian cancer or also is a protein that, that uh, appears to um, increase with iron and increase for uh, heart function and a whole lot of other things. Um, it is uh, one of those things that is not going to uh, necessarily solve the problem. The reason is that these proteins go up and down depending on what you ate, how many viruses you had, how many colds you had, 
how much sleep you got and whatever. So what happens is that whenever people end up with one magic bullet, at the end, it ends up being disappointing. Because remember those 70 trillion cells? I mean, if just one protein could answer all these different questions about how you live your life, uh, is not is not going to be a, you know the right answer. So I I really don't know. None of us are medical doctors, but we work with medical doctors, and so you know. Misunderstanding. I meant uh, if if you could all say something about C-reactive protein. Oh. The other the other stuff about how I live my life is what I would do with your information. Uh, well, you know, if you um, Google the web they would <laughs> tell you so much about C-reactive protein. I mean, my knowledge is what I gave you, that, uh, that it's one of those things that does, sometimes correlates with something and sometimes it doesn't. And what doctors are afraid of is that when you make these things, it's like the proteins they, they, they do for prostate that is now falling into a, a bad uh, reputation because it leads to too many surgeries that are not needed or it leads to so many uh, false alarms and it leads to so much more anxiety. So um, that's, that's all I can, I can say about it. Th thank you. So Christy, I have to ask a question. Mental exercise or physical exercise, which is better? I mean, is it okay if you're kind of a runner who doesn't read as much as you should? Is that gonna be protected? <laughs> <coughs> Both. I think we should all strive <laughs> yes. for maintaining a, an entire body, mind, body, and maybe for some of you even soul, um, health <laughs> okay. and exercise. Okay. That's what I'll say for that. All right. All right, next question over here. This one's for me to yes. sell. You used the term tissue polarity. What did you mean by that? Uh huh. It's a very good question. Remember where I showed you that uh, three-dimensional structure we called an asinus? Yes. Every cell and every tissue in your body is polar, meaning they have a bottom, they have a top. So in those, and there is again wisdom on that topness and bottomness. When you have an asinus, the way I showed you, and there's a hole inside, okay? Milk goes inside, and the extracellular matrix that I was talking about goes outside. Now the extracellular matrix then talk to the nucleus of the cells and gives it certain kind of protein that are on the top membrane, meaning pointing inside, or at the outside, which is the basal side of this asinus. Now trying to tell people about the importance of polarity, I like to say to them, imagine that your baby would suck the mother's breast and would get a mouthful of basement membrane or extracellular matrix as opposed to milk. It'll be a real mess. Things will not work. Or imagine about your bladder, putting urine in the wrong place, right? Or your sweat glands, doing, putting the sweat somewhere. Almost everything in your body is polar, both at the level of cell, at the level of the protein, and at the level of the tissue and at the level of the unit of the tissue. So in the liver, there is a top, bottom, left, right, and each one of them have wisdom. And the polarity means that the top and the bottom are not the same. They have, they have different structures and different proteins, which then lead to different functions that our body needs. So that's not a function of the um, electrical charge on the tissue per se, but overall structures. Okay. I said th thank you. Uh, next question, please. Uh, yeah, hey. Um, so I heard Gary mention the word, you know, evolution, and that's come up in a number of, um, you know, times of what people have been talking about tonight. Um, I read a poll recently where something like 78% of Americans doubt or have doubts about evolution. Um, my own background is, you know, um, essentially, it's never been proven false. Um, um, you know, it's just <laughs> the way science works, it's certain, essentially. Um, I guess um, my question is, uh, how do you guys respond to that? And to what extent um, does succeeding in curing cancer depend on the kind of mind that, or maybe that's, that's a bad way of phrasing it, but 
you know, the kind of thought process that goes into maybe a understanding of and use of the theory of evolution and how much, sorry, that's just too much, but <laughs> what's your response to, you know, the fact that such a high Does number- Does belief in evolution affect the, the nature of their research? That's no, a great question. The yeah. first, the, the, wait, 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 wait. Where is this poll and who took it? I, actually, I'll, the reason I found it is I know that, the, I don't know what the exact numbers are. The reason I found it is when I was up thinking about this question, I did a quick Google, and <laughs> one of the responses, the highest number that came back was 78%. So All right. I, it's not quite that high, thank goodness. Okay. But I, but you know, yeah. It's like thir I think it's, the polls I've seen are 30, 40, mm -hmm. 50% maybe. I think, um, let's see, the first part of the question, <laughs> um, uh, I think that the evidence is quite clear that um, it's not a theory. Uh, Organisms clearly evolve, and uh, we can argue about the mechanisms. Right, right. Um, well, well, in science, now, a, a theory, of course, there are no laws in, in, in science. A theory is as strong as you get, right? I think that, um, you know, the, the, I'm using that word because that's often used to denigrate the idea that that's evolution right. occurs, that it's a theory that's on equal, it has, has equal weight with creation theory. And I think it's fine. I mean, scientists, in fact, do not have to be um, uh, uh, believers in evolution to do science. Right. Um, you can certainly be religious and have a strong belief in God. And in mm -hmm. fact, the uh, head of the National Institutes of Health published a, yeah. Francis Collins published a, a book last year about describing his own um, uh, uh, religious beliefs and, and how they can coexist with, with his science. So I think the point is that, as, as Mina showed, that you need to have an open mind uh, and, yeah. and consider all the possibilities. And, you know. But there are some that have more evidence on their side than others. <laughs> and if, <laughs> and when, you get, when you get to a point where the evidence becomes very hard to refute or disregard, then you say, this theory looks a lot more like what actually happened. And I mean, it's absolutely boggles my mind that these little flies have the genes that you and I have, and they actually have the same function. <laughs> and that the fossils that we find, we can now date very accurately to so many hundreds of millions of years ago that, that there's just no refuting it, okay? It's just like sitting there and saying, Earth is flat. So Thank you. I <laughs> Next question, please. Hi, I'm a, I'm a little nervous about this. I, I've heard that you can't ask a stupid question, but this may not. This may there be are one. no stupid questions, um, This is a matter of kind of reasoning. I've heard that, um, I'm just gonna say Alzheimer's, but it could be for anything. There, you, you, the lady who spoke about Alzheimer's said that most, but not all, uh, patients with Alzheimer's have the plaques that aggregate. Um, what interests me is the ones who do not have that. It, to me, kind of reasoning it, you know, because I don't know anything about this, but it seems like if there's someone who has Alzheimer's who doesn't have the plaques, either there's a whole lot of kinds of Alzheimer's, and some have plaques and some don't, or there's a precursor thing, and some form the plaques and some don't, and why aren't you looking for the precursor? So that's my question. It's my own reasoning. I don't understand. So I'm, I'm going to try to, um, unfortunately, with the 10 minutes they told me I could have. I couldn't go into everything. But I'm going to share with you, um, I just saw a recent talk by Bill Jagus um, from Life in Sciences, our in our division at Life Sciences. And what he uh, showed us was really interesting. It's the idea that these plaques, so first of all, these neurodegenerative diseases, we also consider them to be aging diseases because they take time to form. And what he's shown is that these plaques, these aggregates, um, it may be that their role in disease happens early on. And so earlier on when these aggregates are starting to form is where sort of toxicity builds up in the cells and it's over time that these cells start to experience, um, you know, loss of neurons and, and uh, brain atrophy. And so by the end, when you look at the older patients, um, whether or not they have plaques may not be as um, indicative of disease as opposed to if you look
back maybe you know a few years earlier before they start to show these symptoms, that may be um, where those plaques come in and play a role in disease. And so when we're looking at, so now that we have these tools to look at, at, at Alzheimer's patients, what we want to do now is, is, look, is look back further and see what's the trend for, for these individuals and who develops the disease and who doesn't. Thank you. I think what, one thing that I would add to yeah. that is that um, often in medicine, diseases are grouped together that don't, in fact, turn out to have the same causes. And so I, I'm not I sure whether this is true yes. for Alzheimer's yes. per se, but it could easily broad. be the yeah. case that they're grouped together because they have strong similarities, but in fact, um, you know, it's enough, the ones without amyloid plaques are a different uh, cause right. of neurodegeneration. That's what I was wondering. So I thank, mean, simply also you. breast cancer, you know, we used to think it was one kind of cancer. We now know it's hundreds of different. Right. Uh, in fact, if you email uh, the laboratory, the, you probably have it, they can send you this article. And uh, he discusses that quite nicely about the complexity as is not only complexity in cancer, but in complexity in all of these. Everybody says breast cancer, but we now know breast cancer is at least four kinds, if not five, if not six, if not seven. Right. And they behave differently and they need to be treated differently and you know. And so um, he, he had some very good things to tell us. And the nicest thing was that they think they have a test that is quite astonishing, and nobody knows why, but it seems to distinguish very, very, very early signs of something which may lead to dementia or whatever. And I volunteered to go take it. <laughs> Thank you. Next question, please. Thank you. Hi. Um, you, there were a couple points in the talks where uh, you mentioned that in certain genes there are factors, or certain chromosomes there are genetic uh, bits that make you more likely to get certain types of cancer. And you showed that if you, you know, you could cause these cells to get cancer and then add something else in to uh, sort of reverse the cancer. Oh, you're talking to me. Okay. Well, actually, both, yeah. both you and Sue did, had examples of this. Yes, that's right. And I'm wondering, can you, if you add these curative factors in earlier? Do they prevent the cancer from happening in the first place? Well, I, um, uh, I actually think the, the results I showed you and some of the results that Sue showed you uh, show you a hopeful view of cancer, which mm -hmm. says that once a cancer cell, not always a cancer cell, people know that in some cases, cancers actually slow down and you can differentiate them and revert them. But I think there is a real misconception among people about eradicating cancer as opposed to curing cancer. In other words, I don't think we can eradicate cancer the same way that we can't eradicate aging. Until such time that we can't keep people young, we can't eradicate cancer because cancer and aging go absolutely hand in hand and it's partly because of all the things I talked about. Structure goes, all these wrinkles are not good for you and <laughs> surgery doesn't help you because that has a different problem. So just because they look good, it doesn't mean underneath everything is right. But, but what you could do is you could, as I said, you have many, many initiated cells in your body if they took my breast at my age and sectioned it, they will find little pieces of cells that have what, what we call atypia or carcinoma in situ. If some men start having prostate cancer at age 16, you know, they have um, a motorcycle accident and they, they, they look and they find all these different tumors and they don't go very far because the microenvironment keeps them in check. So one of the things people could do is to try and prevent from the initiated cells from going very far. And we are now learning about how to help some of these things. And I hate to keep harping on this, but one way of doing it is diet, and another way is exercise. <laughs> I mean, there are, we know that even those people who have had cancer, if they exercise, there are a lot of good things your body makes both in your brain and the rest of it, that appears to slow down the recurrence of metastasis and the rest of it. It's much better 
especially if taken in combination with a lot of other things that are good for you. So I think you can end up having cancers that are like diabetes, that are like, like um, chronic diseases, but you can keep them in check. And in a way, we now do it for one form of leukemia. We can give these patients a, a drug like interferon or retinoic acid, and they can differentiate. And the patient is perfectly fine for 10 years, 15 years, and then they mutate and it relapses, and then they give them a different kind of drug and it differentiates, and they live perfectly good lives. And I'm hoping that we could do that for um, other kinds of cancer sometime in the future, if we really open our minds to this importance of the microenvironment on the way that tumor cells behave. Thank you, next question. Uh, hi, I'm a computer programmer by trade, and I recently uh, got a job at the Joint Bioenergy Institute. And I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who's a biologist, and when she found out that I got that job, she was very frustrated because she said that uh, all of the good jobs in biology and those other sciences are now being taken up by computer programmers. <laughs> <laughs> And so I kind of felt a little guilty, but it made me wonder, is there some sort of an adversarial uh, relationship coming up, or uh, are there actually jobs being taken from biologists and you know, given to programmers? I, I, no, no, you're, you're, you don't need to feel guilty. Um, no, you're computation. Synergistic. No, you know, biology today is, is very multidisciplinary. We have to grab. Uh, technologies and, and, and ways of extracting information from all over. Um, and, and, and in the last, I'd say, 10, 15 years, computation has become really, really important. It's, it's critical for the kinds of genome studies and epigenome studies that, that uh, uh, Sue and I work on. It's um, absolutely crucial for image analysis. Um, a lot of what we do in terms of imaging and creating pretty movies, we actually want to actually quantitate what's going on. <laughs> and, um, and so there's, there's a huge uh, a benefit to incorporating computational approaches into biology. So I view it more as a partnership than, <laughs> than adversarial. And, and it's an essential partnership, as, as Gary alluded to, because um, our data sets are larger and larger. Um, we really need to have more sophisticated programs that are um, newer algorithms that allow us to deal with large data sets. And, uh, but you know, like any other discipline, um, it's not just that you have biology, you have physics, you have chemistry, you have computation biology. In every one of these disciplines, you have a lot of people who are doing really inspired science and there are others who are doing good science, and there are those who don't belong there. So, <laughs> so but we have lots of all kinds, right? But, but we all actually are seeking computation biologists in all the kinds of work we do, and we try to find those who can understand the biology so they won't simply add numbers and give us something, but somebody who actually has a dynamic reciprocity <laughs> you know, to go back and forth and, and learn from each other. And they are, they are absolutely indispensable. And I don't know why this friend of yours said that. I think she had a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> Next but they, question, please. They we have cost time for, too much. We have time for a couple more questions. Yes. Yeah, um, you clearly done some amazing research here. My question regard, is regarding the uh, flow of information between ac academia and discoveries that you've made and flowing that information to the industry, especially because everyone kind of has their own self-interest, but for the overall, let's say, human interest, everyone should share that information. Can I get your thoughts on that? Um, sure. Uh, everything we do is open source. Actually, um, the National Institutes of Health has a library of medicine, and we put all of our data publicly out for the community, of the research community at large, and anyone, actually, you can um, download all these data sets. Anybody can get access to them. Everything that we do at the lab is, is um, absolutely available to everyone. So it's, it's essential. And it's um, actually something that um, NIH is working on. They've um, uh, made a new institute called Translational Medicine. And the goal is actually to move things from research into uh, the clinic uh, much more quickly. So that's an ongoing very new um, agenda for, for NIH. I, I, 
would add to that that um, there is a, at the lab especially, there is a great interest in translating basic research discoveries into uh, uh, something that can help <laughs> the country or the universe. We are a, a national lab. Um, and this new uh, campus that's gonna be built in four years up in Richmond, um, which I, I don't know if you wanna announce whatever name we're using these days, right, but- The Richmond Bay Campus. The Richmond Bay Campus. Um, the plan there is to actually, I mean, there, the plan now is to have one building built, but both between UC and LBNL um, to build a much larger campus that will include embedded in that uh, industrial partners. So that, that in fact there's much more communication uh, between people who, you know, we're not <laughs> the people who bring things to market. That's not our specialty. Um, but we need closer associations with those people. And this model has worked down at Mission Bay. Um, for UCSF, where there are industrial partners like Bayer and things like that, um, who are more integrated with, with what the basic research. Yeah, and we also have a lot of collaboration with companies. But, but one of the things, they come to us, or you know, when they come and they want to take some of the discoveries we have made and make it into a venture capital, et cetera. Now, a number of us here, I don't know about uh, Sue, but I know about Gary and myself, and Chris is too young to yet uh, open a company, but many of us have chosen not to do it. And I, uh, from very early days, we had some stunning stuff we could have um, actually spun off, but I always felt that I personally didn't want to do that because I felt that it would pre preclude me from actually discussing the data, and furthermore, it would make me have to say some things that I don't want to say and are not 100% truth. I did not want to stand in front of the investors and say, I'm going to cure cancer tomorrow. Is this drug that I have or this molecule that I have is going to just make your hair grow and, and do this and that or whatever. And so as a result, I never did that. And even when I um, consulted for companies, they would let me consult for them once or twice and then they wouldn't ask me again. Because I would say, I would say, what? You're going to put this in humans before you have done blah, blah, and they didn't like it. So not everybody's like that, but, but I do think that there is a, um, I am a little bit sorry about how much, how many of the scientists have become so darn rich because biology has become a real big, huge business. And, and it, you know, people spin off these companies left and right, and some of it really prevents them from sharing and from wanting and from wanting to change their mind because a lot of money rides on it. But I don't know what to do about that because some of it is good, but some of it is not good. It's like everything else in life. So you have to be careful with whom you collaborate, what are your conditions are, and what you would let the company to do with your intellectual property, and what you won't. I, I don't want to leave you with the impression <laughs> that little cleanup most here. scientists, most biologists behave in this way. In fact, it's, it's a, a small minority. Most scientists, like Mina was saying, I mean, we're not involved in any companies, and that is a conscious choice. But I think it, it, is, it, it exists, and there are problems there, but in fact, most biologists are not in that position and are not compromised in, in terms of, of how they can share their science and how that can be translated into, into medical treatments. So would you guys agree that there's a strong sense of social responsibility among the scientists of the lab? Uh, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, audience. Thank you, panelists. Please watch our website for advertisements about our next Science of Theater. We have a very special one planned in October. More about that soon.